Hello and welcome to this press conference launching the Global Risks Report for 2022. My name is Adrian Monk here at the World Economic Forum in Geneva, joined by Borga Brenda, by Sadia Zahidi, and from some of our partners in producing the report, Karina Klimt, who heads Risk at Marsh, and Peter Geiger, who's Chief Risk Officer at Zurich. Welcome everyone. We'll have contributions from all of those folks to start and afterwards we'll be taking questions. Uh, we aim to finish on time being based in Switzerland and taking these things very seriously. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to the president of the World Economic Forum, Burger Brenda, to introduce this year's 17th Global Risks Report. Borga. Thank you so much, uh, Adrian, and uh, thank you especially to Sadia and her risk team, but also to our great partners uh, so we could uh, deliver on this uh, risk report. And as we all know, there has not been a lack of risks uh, the last year, and there will be also a lot of risks uh, moving forward. Uh, we are still in the middle of uh, a pandemic, but uh, we have in a very short time also developed uh, effective vaccines. Vaccines that usually can take a decade to develop happened in the year in a unique uh, public-private cooperation. And we also saw at the COP26 in Glasgow that public-private cooperation is crucial to also mitigate risks moving forward and to deal with them. What it is uh, very clear in this report, and my colleagues will go into it uh, in depth, is that uh, in the survey, um, all the respondents are also more and more underlining uh, the environmental and climate uh, crisis that we are faced with. Our uh, planet is on fire and we have to deal with it. And uh, this is a risk that we really, really know. So we cannot say that we are faced with a blind spot. Uh, it is really also clear in the risk report that uh, the respondents say there are two main challenges. One is a lack of implementation of what was agreed at COP26, uh, a lack of implementation possibly on the net zero way of thinking in this century. And the second risk is then related to effect of lack of uh, implementation and reaching 1.5 degrees zero is dramatic weather consequences, droughts, uh, floods, wildfires, and etc. And here is, of course, adaptation measures necessary. The other one uh, main risk that we are faced with, according uh, to uh, the survey, is uh, inequalities and social uh, crisis. We have seen um, growing inequalities and how are we going to make sure that the social market economy is also using the necessary tools uh, to address uh, these uh, challenges. And here I strongly believe that stakeholder capitalism, that the World Economic Forum is strongly, strongly then arguing for companies also taking increased responsibilities uh, in society is one important uh, piece of this. Short term, we are faced uh, with uh, global supply chain uh, challenges. Uh, we do believe that they will continue also uh, this uh, year. We know there is huge inflationary pressure and we also know uh, due to the response to the crisis, there is a um, looming debt crisis in the world that also reduces um, the fiscal ammunition moving forward among uh, governments. And here, I also believe that uh, if we're going to deal then uh, with uh, inequalities, going to deal effectively also with uh, climate and nature uh, challenges, we do need uh, more public-private uh, cooperation because the private sector can add to this. On top of it, we also see that uh, geopolitical tension and a fractured world uh, is uh, really a big challenge. And the reality with all the main challenges that we are faced with, global challenges needs global solutions. And are those solutions going to be developed in this uh, fractured world? Let's see. Over back, over back to you again, uh, Adrian. Thanks, Bulga. Well, Sadia, you and your team produced this year's report. 
And uh, can you take us a little bit deeper, perhaps, on the kind of key issues that you identified in putting this together? Great. Thank you very much. And again, thanks to the team that put this together, the Global Risks Initiative team, and to our partners, Zurich, uh, Marsh, and the SK Group. Um, let me uh, put up uh, a bit of the data from this 17th edition of the Global Risks Report. And we uh, adapted our survey this year to understand a bit more about where the global mindset was among the thousand experts that responded to this survey. And first off, it's very clear that this confluence of all of the factors that have come together, all of the challenges that we're currently facing, are leading to a fairly pessimistic outlook. 84% of the people that responded to the survey said that they were either worried or concerned about the outlook for the world. Less than 4% were optimistic about the outlook for the world. Let's go a little bit more in depth into some of these results. Um, we asked people to look back at the last two years of the pandemic and identify which are the risks that became worse since the COVID-19 crisis started. And what's very clear is that um, above everything else, social cohesion has eroded. There are deep concerns about livelihood crisis. There are concerns about climate action failure, concerns about mental health deterioration, and then finally concerns about extreme weather. These five really stand out um, compared to other areas. If we could go to the next set of data. We also asked people when some of these risks will become a critical threat to the world. And in the next couple of years, there continues to be deep concern around both the climate side of things and the social side of things. So extreme weather, livelihood crisis, climate action failure, um, uh, infectious diseases, of course, the pandemic has not gone away. And so there continues to be concern around that. And then of course, social action cohesion. On the other hand, if you look at the next sort of five to 10 years out, that's where you see um, a lot of concern around, you know, you can see the top five are all green. So climate action failure, extreme weather, biodiversity loss, natural resource um, crises, uh, and human-made environmental damage. Somewhere in the middle of this, um, which is really the, the next sort of two to five years out, there's concern about climate issues, there is concern about the social issues, but there's also concern around cybersecurity failure. There's also concern around um, geoeconomic confrontations. Uh, so you're starting to see quite a mix of things that are the bridge between the short-term timeframe and the longer term. And finally, the last set of data. We also asked people about risk mitigation efforts and how they believe um, some, of this, um, some of these efforts are working. Um, the good news is that um, people are generally fairly optimistic about how uh, trade facilitation is being managed, how international crime is being managed. They're fairly uh, pet optimistic also about how health crises are being dealt with or how natural disaster relief is being provided. But some of the new and emerging areas like artificial intelligence, like space exploration, like cyber attacks and migration and refugees, those are areas where people don't believe that much is being done in the best possible way moving forward. I'll stop there, Adrian. Um, you can go take a look at the report. It's live now and explore that data a bit more. Thanks for that, Sadia. Yeah, and just for the few of you mentioning that it was difficult to see and read some of those slides, it's not a test. Um, we are actually making them available in the report so you can go back and have a look at them in detail uh, inside the report. And I think someone's posting a link in the chat for you there. Um, turning now to Carolina Klimt at Marsh. Carolina, can you talk us through some of the deeper kind of uh, business facing risks that you see inside this year's report? Absolutely, Adrian. And thank you, Sadia, for that sobering overview of, of this year's report. On the corporate side, we hear a lot of talk about ESG, and it's increasingly clear that good governance and improved resilience really go hand in hand with collaborative, credible, and sophisticated risk management uh, plans. Cyber attacks are not new, but what we've seen, their intensification over the last two years means that cyber threats are now growing faster than our ability to prevent and manage them effectively. 
Companies trying to survive the pandemic have been under more pressure than ever to digitize and automate. But too often, this has been built on the backbone of aging technology, which has led to supply chain disruptions and greater exposure to cyber attacks, and, and especially ransomware. And cyber attacks have also become more costly. In 2021, we saw the highest average cost of a data breach in almost two decades. And in addition, cyber insurance pricing is going up. For example, prices in the United States rose by 96% in the third quarter of 2021. There are plenty of cyber risks that keep the C-suite up at night, but there are four that I wanna point out that need to be tackled. Critical infrastructure failures, an increasingly aggressive regulatory environment, unprecedented identity theft, and the failing to execute digital transformation effectively. Companies soon won't be able to claim good ESG credentials without addressing these key areas. But if you think cyber risk is rapidly evolving, many organizations haven't even started contemplating the risks for them in space. Not that long ago, we, we thought of space as the final frontier, and now it's more accessible than ever. 2021 saw the birth of space tourism and a record number of uh, orbital space launches globally, with 70,000 planned for the next decade. And while these are all really exciting developments, the dated space governance regime risks holding them back. Our planet is surrounded by a literal junkyard of human-made space debris with nuts and bolts, discarded rocket parts, empty fuel tanks, broken satellites. And in addition to growing geopolitical tensions, these objects pose a serious threat to global communications and the future of our ambitions in space. But if we can manage these emerging risks successfully, we will be able to realize the full potential for, for technological and human advancement that space presents. So these and other global risks identified in this year's report demonstrate the need for countries and companies to improve their organizational resilience and learn from the failures and successes of, of the past two years. Resilience is a journey, not a destination. It's really important that resilience measures focus not only on a company's own assets and processes, but also the vulnerabilities of those in their supply chain, utilities, service providers, suppliers, and also customers. Part of the problem here is that too often society has rewarded efficiency over resilience and growth over sustainability. And that's a really short-term outlook, which as we have seen with the pandemic can leave companies vulnerable to shocks. Allowing for little slack in the system may enable businesses to adapt to change more quickly. The pandemic has also highlighted the importance of connecting risk to strategy. And this includes strengthening communications with stakeholders and empowering leaders and employees to make real-time decisions. In addition, diverse and inclusive organizations outperform their peers. Diversity helps companies better understand the markets they serve and enables them to take a more holistic view of the emerging risk landscape. So we need to build greater resilience at local, national and global levels. Governments, businesses, communities and NGOs must work more closely together than ever before. And by building real partnerships between the public and private sectors based on new approaches to risk mitigation, allocation and data sharing, we can make choices now that will enhance our risk preparedness and, and resilience. And by taking these steps, when the next crisis emerges, we will be ready to respond with greater agility and cohesiveness and able to create a more sustainable future for our world. Thank you. Carolina, thanks for that. Um, no global risk report would be complete without a don't look up moment. And uh, Peter, um, I think you're probably best placed here to uh, deliver that moment to uh, everyone. Uh, can you tell us a bit more about the climate uh, dimension to the risk report this year? Thank you, Adrian. Uh, happy to. But COVID-19, with its economic and societal consequences, continues to pose a critical threat to the world, leaving long-lasting effects on social cohesion and the global economy, which is expected to be 2.3% smaller by 2024 than it would have been without the pandemic. 
The Global Risk Report highlights that in the next five to 10 years, climate action failure and the environmental risk it brings, namely extreme weather events, are perceived to be the most critical long-term threats to the world. One of the important long-term consequences of the pandemic is the effect it will have on the world's ability to address these important global environmental challenges. Reducing the attention and focus needed for governments to take effective and quick climate action, halving greenhouse gas emissions in the next decade and achieving the net zero transition by 2050, or risking massive disruption from the consequences of a materially warmer climate. The economic impacts of the pandemic, including tight supply chains, rising commodity pricing, inflation, and especially increased levels of public debt and central banks that can hardly become more interventionist, make it even more challenging for nations to start implementing transition policies that will have material impacts on their economies and citizens. It is hard to see how any transition of this scale can be anything but disruptive and disorderly, especially if greenwashing or stalling on commitments delay the transition. Then there will be even more disruption as more radical policies will be required to decarbonize and achieve the net zero transition goals. While progress was made at the recent COP26 meeting, the latest commitments are falling well short of the 1.5 degree net zero goal and are instead expected to steer the world towards a 2.5 degrees warming. However, agreement at the COP26 on Article 6 of the Paris Agreement, the rulebook on carbon trading, will help drive the transition. And the new IFRS framework will help improve disclosure standards. It is economic drivers like an expectation of rapidly increasing carbon price that are likely to have the greatest impact on consumers and businesses in terms of revealing the protection they have been afforded from the historic and deliberate mispricing of carbon. The consequences of this will create social, societal, economic and geopolitical risks that are at the heart of the transition that net zero goals by 2050 demand where innovation, incentives, and policies fail to stimulate effective market solutions, increased costs and job losses in carbon-intense industries, which currently employ millions of workers, could trigger economic volatility, create material labor market disruptions, and increase societal and geopolitical tensions. So what can be done to resolve it? Actions that need to happen are those which change incentives, consumer behaviors, and demand destruction for carbon-intensive goods and services. That creates both risks and opportunities. But fortunately, governments, consumers, and businesses are becoming increasingly focused on sustainability and climate change. It is becoming a critical strategic question for any business how to position itself in that foreseeable transition. As in any transition, there will be winners and losers, and failure to adapt will lead to loss of relevance, and as history has demonstrated regularly, the disappearance of companies or whole sectors. Waiting for governments to lead with regulation risks losing too much time for the innovation and transition required. The transition to net zero will be as transformative as past industrial revolutions. To be timely and successful, this transition will need stakeholders to be innovative, determined, and inclusive to protect the planet, economies, and people. Thank you very much for taking on the Leonardo DiCaprio role in today's Global Risk Report launch. Um, first question is from London, and Larry Elliott, business editor at The Guardian. Larry, uh, thanks for joining. Sorry not to be able to see you in person, but uh, great to see you virtually. Um, can you share your question with us? Yeah, morning, Adrian. Uh, the uh, sentiment is uh, is shared. A real, real pity that uh, we're not going to be able to meet next week. But uh, anyway, good to, good, to, good to hook up. Um, this is not the first time that climate has dominated the global risk report. I mean, it bears striking resemblance to last year's report, which also highlighted climate as a big, big challenge. Is there any indication that people are listening to this global risk report? And if if not, why not? Is it because the pandemic is actually just crowding out 
climate as an issue or are there other deeper factors that mean that people are not really taking your warning with the seriousness it warrants? Good question. Maybe uh, turn to Sadia on that first, Sadia. Well, I mean, are these, you know, are we broadcasting into the void here um, or are people uh, actually taking notice of these kinds of warnings? No, I think that's uh, very much the purpose of this report at the beginning of each year to make sure that we're calling attention to some of the big topics that are on the agenda that need that longer term investment. Um, you know, two years ago, uh, just before the global pandemic um, started, uh, we had mentioned how resilience in global health systems was missing. And, um, you know, a few years before that, um, highlighted the likelihood of a, the pandemic. And uh, 2011 is the first year in which climate change um, rose to being among the top five most likely risks facing the world. And I think if we look at the movement that's currently underway, it is very clear that leaders are looking at how to make the climate um, transition, how to make uh, mitigation against climate change possible, how to manage this green transition. But what's also clear if we look at the latest results of the report, is that governments have a balancing act to work with. In the short term, there are a number of economic transitions that they also need to manage. So for example, shifting from the emergency stance that many governments have had and all of the stimulus funding that has been providing, shifting towards more of a recovery stance and more of a resilience stance that puts in pl into place investments for the future. Um, the second area in which they're having to do a balancing act is around jobs and social cohesion. Uh, Peter mentioned you know, the number of people that are employed in carbon intensive industries that's certainly not the only place in which governments are having to manage a jobs crisis and to deal with the fallout from the pandemic. So, for example, mental health crises were among the top five areas that, be, that worsened over the course of these last two years. 53 million additional cases of depression alone because of the pandemic. So there's a number of other factors in the short term that I think governments are having to balance against the green transition, which is clearly um, you know, one of the major issues that has to be dealt with. Um, come to Borger in a second, perhaps Carolina and Peter, um, just to, you speak regularly to other business leaders. To what extent are they listening to these warnings? Carolina. Yes, I think, I mean, the pandemic has definitely been a distraction. I think there's no question about that. But I think at the same time, we continue to see temperatures, sea level rises, extreme weather events, wildfire, catastrophic floods worldwide. So it's not like we can... I mean, claim that this is this is a blind spot any longer. It is now compromising critical infrastructure, crop production, and then even the livability of many heavily populated areas. So I think if it's been a blind spot for a while and maybe a little bit distracted by the pandemic, I think it's now definitely up there on the on the agenda. Peter. Yeah, I think I mean part of it is the dilemma that humans are not good in the boiling frog scenario. They're they're very good in, in the fight or flight. Uh, response which we've seen in the pandemic and, and the climate change is a, a boiling frog issue. Uh, having said that, I'll take optimism from the fact that more and more businesses start to think about this as a strategic opportunity as well uh, and, and position themselves or try to find ways to position themselves uh, for a carbon uh, neutral economy. Uh, probably that's the silver lining on the horizon whilst governments are focused on preserving status quo, businesses are more willing to accept that the world is never stable. Bulga. So uh, I think on the commitment side, there has been clear um, also positive uh, developments uh, during the last decade. But as we can see in the report, there are question marks uh, about the implementation. If you look at uh, the situation uh, before Paris, we were uh, really uh, on a four degrees uh, target uh, scenario. After Paris, we were closer uh, to two degrees. And after Glasgow now, we are more on the two degrees um, scenario looking at it. And still it is doable with the 1.5 if you really implement everything that is necessary. 
But here uh, is the challenge. Will uh, the world be able, in a synchronized way, to implement all the necessary measures uh, to reach a 1.5 uh, degrees uh, target in the coming decades? And I think this is an indication that there are question marks around this. And if that doesn't happen, then we see the second concern uh, also mentioned uh, by uh, Carolina and Peter is uh, the dramatic uh, consequences then related to weather, droughts, uh, floods, and etc. But on the positive side, though, uh, no, we are close to a situation where uh, almost 80% of all the global emissions are part of a commitment towards a net zero. Only five years ago, there was less than 20% of the global emissions that were part of like a net zero um, planning. So I would say that risk report and other reports uh, really showing that the cost of action, uh, the, the cost of inaction far exceeds uh, cost of uh, action is having an impact. So we are seeing positive developments, not as fast and not as deep as we would have liked, but we are moving uh, in the right direction, hopefully. Borga, thanks very much. Uh, I can see a lot of questions queuing up, so we'll try and, and move through them uh, briskly to uh, get you all a chance to come in. Um, I'm gonna go next to Torsten uh, Rika and also to Thomas Seifert. Thomas is joining from Wiener Zeitung and Torsten from Handelsblatt. Torsten, can I get your question first and then Thomas will bring you in. Yes, good morning and thanks for having me uh, here in the virtual uh, meeting. So um, I want to come to the business equation of uh, our debate. And uh, Joe Kaser, the former CEO of Siemens, recently said, uh, society is the most important stakeholder of a company at the moment. So I wonder, the erosion of the social cohesion is the risk that worsened most since the start of the pandemic. What could and should business leaders actually do to stop that erosion and to fill in the cracks in our society? Thanks. Great question. And Thomas, can we just get your question too? Sure. Yes, this is Thomas Seifert from Wiener Zeitung in Vienna. And also, I hope to see you guys all in summer in Davos. So hopefully, uh, when, when you look out at the horizon, uh, what does the, the post-COVID uh, landscape look like uh, when it comes to geopolitics? Because already uh, the, the question before was uh, talking about uh, the, all the fissures uh, and so in societies, but also we see a bigger world that nations are also more lined up against each other rather than cooperating with each other, especially when it comes to, you know, Russia versus the European Union and, of course, the United States. We see that right now. And also, uh, of course, the climate between China and uh, the West has also uh, really um, yeah, hit a low point, I would say, at least since uh, a long, long time. So maybe you wanted to elaborate a little bit on the geopolitical risk landscape as well. Thank you so much. Thanks for that. Uh, so I might turn to, uh, for the business side on social cohesion to our two business uh, panelists, and then perhaps uh, look at geopolitics with my forum colleagues here. Um, so perhaps first looking at the uh, social cohesion measures that businesses can take to address this issue that we highlight here in the Global Risk Report. Peter, what are some of the kinds of things that you're uh, seeing maybe at Zurich and also in other parts of the business landscape that can address some of this uh, social cohesion issue? Well, I mean, at, at the end of the day, I mean, businesses serve societies. Uh, I mean, we, we have no reason for being unless we're serving societies. Uh, but in terms of the social cohesion, I think it's a big expectation for businesses to take care of that. We actually engage in uh, education, for example, uh, uh, development of skills for our uh, staff base and so on and so forth. But that's a very small contribution from a societal perspective. Uh, in, in that respect, I think businesses have a role to play, but we shouldn't overestimate the impact of the individual business. Collectively, I think being inclusive is the most important contribution that, that we're making. Uh, and being truly inclusive is, I think, an ongoing challenge in, in a world that is ever-changing. And Carolina, we've seen business step up in, in the 
sustainability space. But what about in this social cohesion space? Is there a gap there that businesses can fill? I think part of what drives this risk to social cohesion is the lack of trust. And I think, you know, coming together, looking at ways of partnering uh, public-private partnerships and looking at ways to foster that trust and, and deploy strategies that are based on really principled science-based decisions. I think that's really important in order to, for, for businesses to help drive um, a positive development in this area. <clears throat> Excuse me. The other thing that I'll say is that the rise of uh, stakeholder capitalism and shareholder activism and that increased appetite from companies to use ESG targets and metrics. I think actually ESG can be one of those things that can help drive trust, but it really, and it will reshape the financial and economic landscape, but it also really takes companies delivering on commitments made so that they don't find themselves in, you know, to be uh, accused of greenwashing. And I think that's a really important element now that companies actually deliver and execute on promises made. Thanks, Carolina. Um, turning to the risk landscape, that was uh, Thomas's question. What do uh, you see as the kind of the geopolitical kind of dimensions to this 2022 risk report? Sadia. Um, on the, I think if we take a look at the experience of the last couple of years, um, it's very clear that uh, most governments turned inward. Um, most of them focused on uh, some of the short-term crises and issues that they're dealing with internally. And what is increasingly clear is that if we're going to tackle the numerous challenges that this report is pointing to, global cooperation and global coordination is going to be key. And that's really the key message coming out of the report, that now that we shift a little bit away from the emergency mindset, it's going to be necessary to build bridges between economies. And that's going to be one of the tensions that governments will need to manage because a whole host of the crises that they're going to be facing are going to look very different nationally, domestically, internally, than if they want to deal with them broadly and globally. Thanks for that. And, uh, and Borga, we're in Geneva. There are talks going on here right now. In the report, we talk about geopolitical confrontation, geoeconomic confrontation as being a five to 10 year risk. Is that something that diplomacy, the action now by governments can help mitigate and that we can actually make sure doesn't come to be something that we're talking about in next year's report? I think the latter is maybe a bit optimistic. I think uh, geopolitical tension will also be uh, a topic uh, for next uh, year's uh, report. But uh, let's hope that uh, the talks uh, going on here in Geneva, the talks going on in Vienna related uh, to the Iran uh, nuclear deal, uh, the JSPOA, uh, also uh, other discussions um, will uh, move into a positive track. Uh, what I said at the beginning is that most of the challenges, and also underlined by Sadia just now, most of the global challenges we're faced with uh, needs global solutions. So if there is no cooperation in a globalized world on these uh, major, major challenges, we will also see less results, less effective results. On the positive side, I, I would then uh, draw the attention, for example, to what happened at uh, COP26. Uh, in the last hours, um, special uh, climate envoy of China, Minister Xie, came together with Secretary Kerry, and they did agree on important text, so there was an agreement from uh, the COP26. Uh, I think also, uh, there is a willingness in areas there where there are common interests to find also common uh, solutions. So uh, a lot is at stake. Also, for example, on the trade side, we see the challenges now on the global supply chain. We just have to hope that there is not uh, this approach like um, beggar thy neighbor, but more the prosper your neighbor. We will have to hopefully come back to a world where we have a win-win approach and not a zero-sum game. This is crucial for prosperity and also for solving the most pressing issues that are outlined in the report. Thanks, Borga. 
Turning next to Laurent Sierro from Switzerland. Uh, Laurent, do we have you on screen? Yes, we do. And can we have you asking your question? Sure. Thank you for taking my question and Happy New Year to, to all of you, despite the challenges we all face uh, ahead of us. Um, as Borger Brandon mentioned, we're still in the middle of that pandemic and, and WHO and other stakeholders often repeat that it's not going to be the last one. But infectious diseases are not among the top risk on the middle to longer term. Does that mean that the experts uh, you surveyed already consider that the world will be better and enough prepared to cope with the future pandemics? Thank you. It's great. So um, Laurent is drawing a silver lining there from the fact that the pandemic risk has, has moved down a little bit. Sadia, is, um, is that conclusion right, that we think that pandemic response will be better um, and that that's what the experts are telling us? I think there's two ways to look at this. One is certainly the silver lining um, uh, interpretation, which is that um, most of our respondents are assuming that uh, the pandemic will have disappeared. We will have made our health systems more resilient. We will be better prepared for the risks created by future inve infectious diseases. The other way to look at this is that um, respondents are incredibly concerned about all of the other global risks that we're not currently building more resilience for, whether that is um, the, the risk of um, uh, asset bubbles, whether that's the risk of um, you know, further um, deterioration when it comes to climate change. And I think it's, it's probably a mix of the two that you're seeing in the results here. Thanks for that. Um, turning now to Ziyu Chen from Yikai. Uh, can we have your question, please? Yes, thank you. Thanks for taking my question. My question will focus on the European part. Uh, we would like to know, given all the global risks we face this year, what could be the most urgent one facing Europe this year? And more specifically, are we going to see the division of the European countries in terms of economic performance? Are we going to see the gap getting bigger and bigger this year? Okay, maybe I can turn first to my colleague, Burger Brenda, just to give a quick uh, perspective on that and then bring in a couple of our other panelists. Bulga. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you for your question. Let me first uh, illustrate it with the global response uh, to the pandemic. Uh, 14 trillion US dollars has been launched in extraordinary stimulus uh, in the world. It has not been synchronized, but it is more stimulus than was launched after the big financial crisis in 2008. And you have to go back uh, also to the Second World War to see something like it. I think this stimulus has brought us through this very, very difficult period. I don't think there was any alternative. No, it is the fine-tuning between continued stimulus and also quantitative easing and the inflationary pressure you face with. And it's true, Europe is also in uh, that mix. I think Europe, with its stimulus package, where it also focused um, the 750 billion uh, euros uh, on the digital transformation and the green transformation, I think there are things that are also moving now uh, and uh, in Europe's uh, interest. I think uh, Europe is more conscious about its competitiveness uh, in the digital and the green uh, transformation and are taking quite a leading role um, on um, the green economy and uh, the transformation. But of course, uh, no, Europe is in the middle of uh, electricity uh, challenges, so that has to be dealt with. So I think the jury is out. I think um, Europe, compared to some emerging economies, and also uh, is uh, back now mainly this year on a pre-COVID level when it comes to its uh, GDP, and is really up now to the European leaders. How do they um, get uh, more competitive, increase its productivity uh, in the years to come. Thanks, Borga. I'm going to quickly um, try and bring in Lucy White from the Daily Mail in London. Lucy, we've only got you on audio, I think. Can we hear your question? Um, I think we are clearly not quite high tech enough to have cameras just yet. But um, no, thanks for taking the question. I mean, it was more um, looking at um, the livelihood crises that are mentioned as one of the short-term risks. I mean, does this specifically 
relate to, you know, kind of inflation worries caused by the pandemic? And um, how does this perhaps differ between emerging markets and developed economies and, um, you know, specifically the UK perhaps as well? And livelihood and jobs are a massive focus also, Sadia, of your work. So I might turn to you first on that and then bring in our business uh, panelists. Sadia, so what's your view on that uh, livelihood crisis issue? Sure. Thank you. Um, I think despite all of the headlines about the great resignation, the reality is that we have overall uh, lower employment than we did before. And we do have at the same time as a number of people leaving their current roles, you know, about 40% as it's currently estimated, we also have at the very same time very high unemployment in many sectors, many parts of the world. So overall, there is an accelerated uh, shift, structural shift in labor markets that was long expected um, since the start of the fourth industrial revolution, but has now been further accelerated because of the pandemic and its after effects and the on, um, ongoing green transition that is really just starting. So a big element of that livelihood crisis is concern around whether there will be good jobs in the future, whether there will be enough jobs in the future, whether workers will have the right skills for all of these new jobs in these new and emerging sectors, and whether there will be support for those that are going to need it in the next few years as they make the transition to their next um, area of, um, of, of gaining an income. In addition, you're seeing a rising inequality. So for example, um, in the short-term results from for example, Brazil and India, two massive emerging markets, digital inequality is among the top five risks that the country is facing. So um, you're starting to see a lot of concern around this sort of fissure that's developed with three billion people that still do not have access to the internet and do not have one major source of gaining an income available to them. So overall, I think that's what's underneath the concern around livelihood crisis. And that's why we're seeing for the first time that that topic is not just present in the next couple of years, but is actually present all the way through in the next 10 year outlook as well. Okay, I can see our, our clock ticking down. I'm gonna see if we can get more questions in, but uh, Peter and Carolina, I just wanna to turn to both of you on that livelihood crisis issue. Is that something you're seeing coming back to you from your experiences, Peter? Well, absolutely. And, and I think there is uh, kind of a divide in the world uh, where I kind of the way uh, Saida just uh, described some of the challenges in the more emerging economies, uh, in, especially in the Western and European economies. I think strategically we have a huge issue with uh, the financing of the social welfare that is promised to the consumers and people are concerned uh, about that outlook, uh, while at the same time we are confronted with shrinking populations and, and, and the lack of acceptance of migration to kind of backfill. So I think that's one of the major uh, dilemmas over the next 15 to 20 years uh, for Europe that, that goes kind of beyond the immediate uh, issue that we have in the labor market. Uh, because strategically, I think that the shrinking population is one of the things that is not discussed enough uh, in terms of the responses we'll find to that. Thanks for that. Carolina. Yeah, I just add that uh, the pandemic has really amplified uh, the livelihood crisis in that we've seen uh, lockdowns and border closures. And I think as a result of that, many young feel that they have been robbed of uh, many avenues of you know, education or international migration or opportunities. And that in turn uh, accelerates the, the social cohesion erosion and that frustration that is increasingly being, being voiced in the streets. And that just goes to show how incredibly interconnected uh, this risk environment is and that we really need to pay attention to it and take a very holistic view uh, of the emerging risk landscape. Thanks for that. Um, turning to Laurie Goering from, uh, from Thomson Reuters. Laurie, your question. Thank you for taking the question. Um, I'm curious how you effectively turn all these net zero pledges that you've been talking about into the kind of swift change that we need. Most of them are voluntary still and, and, and really still far too fuzzy in the critical short-term period of the next decade. 
Um, is it time to give those more teeth and turn them into something other than voluntary pledges? You know, we talked a little bit about activist shareholders and so on, but I'd be curious to see how you speed this up. Peter, I'm going to throw that back to you because <clears throat> you brought climate to the fore in your, in your remarks at the very beginning. You know, does there need to be more, um, more teeth, as Laurie says, behind these, um, these changes? Well, the question is, what teeth do you expect? Is it realistic for governments to kind of come up with stringent regulation in the next few years? And, and that's the time horizon. If you, if, if you look at this kind of this decay, the regulation would need to come in very quickly. I mean, we see how, we see how difficult that seems to be. Uh, the, the business side of it, I think there you see much more developments. You see companies anticipating the change. You see companies trying to adapt. Uh, and, and the private initiatives are starting, I think, to gain more ground because people see the opportunity rather than the regulatory requirement. Uh, and I think that's, from my perspective, the optimistic perspective on it. I, I don't expect governments to lead in this. Your thoughts on that? dimension of the of government regulation yeah i i agree with peter and i think it is probably going to be more connected to the stakeholder capitalism and shareholder activism because that is going to create a real push for companies to stay true to their commitments and also this increased focus on esg targets and metrics uh, because I do think the ESG-based investments that we're seeing is really reshaping the financial and economic landscape. And it's important to recognize that commitments made by businesses and governments now are being closely monitored by civil society organizations and investors, looking out for promises that may, be, may have been made for short-term political or financial uh, gain or might uh, indicate greenwashing. And I think those companies and governments that don't stay true to their commitments, they're gonna suffer. And I think that's going to create that acceleration in development that we, that we need and that we wanna see. Thanks, Carolina. Bring Bulgarin. I agree on the, on the premises in the question, what uh, you can measure, you also get done. So with the commitments, uh, both now from the private sector and also from governments, uh, it should be as uh, clear and um, concrete as possible. For example, at the World Economic Forum, we have this coalition of uh, global SEO climate leaders. And the prerequisite for being part of that uh, alliance is that your company um, then commit and has a plan uh, to go net zero by 2050. That's a prerequisite for entering the alliance. And I think this uh, is one illustration. I think also we will see increased focus in the years to come now, also related to countries that have taken on clear commitments in Glasgow, going net zero by 2040, 2050. Some companies even, companies have said 2030. And I think uh, if you make such a commitment, I think uh, also the media uh, will increasingly hold countries and companies accountable for their pledges. And I think that's a good thing. Thanks for that, Borgen. <clears throat> Time for, I think we've squeezed in a couple more questions. Um, we've got Doe Peng from China News, uh, Damien McElroy. Um, Damien, Dawei, can we get your questions? Doe first. Hello, uh, greetings from Germany. Um, yes, uh, my, actually I have two questions, if I may. Uh, my first question is that the uh, recently the EuroAsia group named China's zero COVID policy as, um, quote, top risk number one for two, uh, 2022. And what's your take on this issue? And my second question is that, uh, given the new characteristics of the Omicron variant, uh, is it time for countries to move on now to focus on some more long-term uh, risks? Thank you. Thanks for that. And uh, Damien, your question. Um, my question's around, you talk about the increased digital innovation, but you also talk about increased digital inequality. Um, I wonder if you could expand on just ways to remedy the inequality and um i was also a bit intrigued about whether you think there is um from all the innovation and interest in space there is going to be 
uh, more global inequality as a result of that. Thanks for those questions. I'm um, going to go for a last tour of our panellists and probably ending with the author um, and head of the report uh, team, Sadia Zahidi. Um, but maybe starting on digital inequality and with space, that seems like a natural link in to Carolina Clint in Stockholm, who uh, addressed that right at the very beginning. Carolina, what's your view on how we can tackle some of that digital inequality? And, and should we be concerned about uh, a, a new space inequality? <laughs> I think that might be a risk, absolutely. And I think, I mean, the digital inequality that we've seen, it will just continue to be amplified given the fact that we depend on digitization so much more uh, today. I mean, with just from a corporate point of view, the switch to remote working would not have been possible and has been more difficult in economies that are not as mature in terms of digitalization and networks. And I think that is a risk that we need to be aware of and we need to continue addressing, absolutely. And I think the same goes true for for, for space. I mean, as a matter of fact, the digitalization and especially global communication is very dependent on space. Space is closer than we might imagine because all of those satellites that are orbiting uh, above us is actually the reason that we can have global communication that is effective. And I think we're going to see increased geopolitical tension now as different countries are really racing uh, towards uh, you know leveraging the opportunities that space uh, presents so absolutely um, an area to continue watching i would say thanks for that <clears throat> peter to dawa's question about uh, omicron and um, and zero covid and perhaps also looking past the pandemic i suppose the very theme of this report is to look up from the present crisis and to look at the risks that are in uh, in the next five to 10 year horizon. Um, what are your kind of concerns uh, and hopes at the end well, of I it? mean, th th these, these coronaviruses, and it's not the first one that hit human populations. I mean, they become endemic. Uh, uh, I, I would give you a, a lot if you could tell me for sure whether the Omicron is now the one that makes it endemic, uh, because that would be the end of what we know as pandemic. Uh, can you? A, a, a zero tolerance for a virus in an interconnected world is, from a risk perspective, an interesting concept. Uh, it reminds me when, when we looked at uh, digital security and had a zero tolerance uh, years ago. I, I think it's as unrealistic. If the world is interconnected, viruses will travel with the humans. Uh, we, I think we have to accept that as a matter of fact. How we deal with that, I think, is subject to local preferences and, and, and political realities. But at the end of the day, I think from a risk perspective, you have to accept that uh, viruses will always travel with the humans. And that if you allow human movement, it, you're bound to transport the viruses. Thanks for that. Um, Borger, just reflecting uh, your kind of final thoughts on this year's risk uh, horizon, if you like, and, uh, and what we should be paying most attention to? I think this has been uh, a very uh, good uh, discussions on uh, some of the main risks uh, that uh, we uh, are facing. We have economically uh, overcome um, the most dramatic uh, possible outcome of uh, the pandemic, even if, of course, by 2024, uh, we would have had 2.4% uh, more economic growth if it wasn't uh, for the pandemic. I think the way the world uh, indirectly came together with that massive stimulus has uh, secured us a, a path forward uh, also for inclusive economic growth. Now, it is up uh, to uh, the leaders. We're not out of the woods uh, on uh, the pandemic pandemic, I would strongly just underline that the World Economic Forum has no uh, concrete views on how concrete countries are handling this. I think each country have uh, the best assessment of how to uh, deal with this. But uh, these kind of challenges we know are global challenges. Uh, uh, pandemic or a virus doesn't travel with the passport and doesn't know uh, borders, that's uh, for sure. I think also uh, the question about uh, inequalities when it comes to the digital piece is critical. If we're going to see more inclusive growth in the years to come, we really have to address heads-on the global 
digital inequalities. 3.6 billion people of the global population are not connected uh, sufficiently to the internet. And how can we then see leapfrogging in these uh, developing countries? That's why also the World Economic Forum with our key uh, partners have uh, launched this Edison Alliance where we try to bring business and governments together and to close this digital gap so everyone should have a chance in the future to be sufficiently digitally uh, connected. Uh, so we can mitigate that risk. So, thank you. Thanks, Borga. <clears throat> and finally, I know uh, report authors always hate this question, but um, I'll have to ask it anyway, Sadia. If there were one thing that you would like people to take away from this report um, as they go away from this press conference, what would that thing be? Hmm. I'm going to say two things. I think one is we do have to acknowledge the rising tension between the current very negative social outcomes and the aspirations that exist to manage this green transition well. Um, over the last uh, couple of years, the richest 20% in the world were able to recover half of their losses, whereas the poorest 20% lost 5% more of their income. In that situation, we do have to think very differently about how do we restore access to education? How do we give people better access to health um, and healthcare? How do we ensure that people do have adequate access to heating and electricity? So there is a lot, and, and to Berge's point, how do we ensure that those 3.6 billion people do actually receive um, connectivity and access to the internet? So there is a tension here that has to be managed, but the second point then is despite all of these global risks and challenges, it is very clear that there is a virtuous cycle that we could be aiming towards that is about restoring growth, but it's about restoring growth and productivity that is inclusive, that is sustainable, and we do have the technologies and the policy capabilities to be able to do that. So it's going to take political will, it's going to take public-private collaboration, it's going to take looking at technology and science and ensuring that we use it, but it is very possible, and we've seen that happen with the development of vaccines. And next week, we will be at the Davos Agenda Week um, looking at how do we ensure that there is better access to those vaccines around the world. We'll be looking at the reskilling revolution that is needed to deal with some of these social issues. We'll be pulling together um, a number of the leaders that are looking at how we ensure uh, greater digital, e digital equality. And of course, we will be pulling together a number of the leaders from various sectors that are looking at managing the climate transition. So stay tuned for that next week. Thank you very much, Sadia. Thanks to our partners in this work, SK Group and representing Marsh, uh, Carolina Clint, representing Zurich, uh, Peter Geiger, and to my colleagues here in Geneva, Burger Brenda, and Sadia Zahidi, and of course, thanks to you for joining us and hope you find uh, interesting data and insights in this year's report. Goodbye from all of us and uh, have a good day. <laughs>